Tennessee Life is sponsored by Mint South Sewing and Fabric has what you need for your creative adventure. If it's sewing, embroidery, or vinyl projects you need for a home business, Etsy, Pinterest, and your family, we have it. Mid South Sewing sells Brothers Sewing and Embroidery Machines and the latest Scan and Cut Crafting Machine. Mid South Sewing and Fabric in the Gallery Shopping Center. Tennessee Life is also brought to you by The Flower Pot. For over 100 years, offering flowers and same-day delivery with two convenient Knoxville locations. KnoxvilleFlowerPot.com and by viewers like you. Thank you. In this edition of Tennessee Life, we get active outdoors with some bicycling, baseball, and paddle boards. First, a U.S. Pro Cycling Champion from Tennessee pedals his way to a huge win. Johnny Brown talks about training and growing up in the volunteer state. AKA hashtag Johnny Knoxville. During the race, even hearing everyone cheer me on, and especially the last lap since Tennessee's where I grew up, I had a lot of people out there rooting for me, and it was giving me chills going through the start finish because there was just so many people that were wanting me to win so bad and were backing me and have seen me race for so many years, so for them it almost felt like a win. It's been unbelievable, the amount of support everyone has shown me now. Come to the Diamond for a baseball game that'll take you back to 1864. The Tennessee Association of Vintage Baseball is dedicated to playing the game the old-fashioned way. I play vintage baseball for the love of the history. At heart, I'm a history geek and a history promoter. I also feel that you should be connected to the place where you live and to the stories that are there. That's what makes us unique and what makes us relevant. And so all those things come together in vintage baseball in a very unique and personal way. Expert and beginner, day and night, people are getting on board. A paddle board right in downtown Knoxville. Those stories next on Tennessee Life. Thanks for joining us for this edition of Tennessee Life, highlighting baseball, boards, and bicycles. I'm your host, Vicki Lawson. Recently, Knoxville hosted the biggest race in American professional cycling, the U.S. Pro National Championship, and one of Tennessee's own conquered the course. Johnny Brown has done it at just 21 years old, making him the youngest cyclist to win the race. We spoke to Johnny about growing up in the volunteer state how he got into cycling, and what it's like to wear that coveted winner's jersey. Back with a live look at the finish line where the professional men are gathering for their start in just a few minutes here. We're gonna start with introducing some of those top riders. I think Knoxville is one of the best places in the country to train because we have the mountains right here, but you don't have to ride the mountains every day if you don't want. So it's like I can ride to the mountains in an hour, but if not, I can go do flats or rolling hills. So it kind of has the best of all worlds. I'm Johnny Brown and I'm the current U.S. Pro National Champion. I'm the youngest person to ever win the U.S. Pro National Championship. So I am 21 years old and it's definitely special for me because going into next year now, I We'll be doing these under 23 races still as the pro national champion and it's never really been done before so it it puts pressure on you but it's at the same time really special i'm originally from tennessee i grew up outside of memphis so it was a small town of about 20,000 people and it was a bit strange because i was homeschooled as well growing up so it was small town homeschooled so a bit secluded sometimes but my dad got me into racing at a really young age and then from there it was starting to travel and visit new places and the homeschool ordeal wasn't too big of a deal then. <laughs> My dad used to race professional back in the 80s. He mostly raced in Costa Rica or Central America so he's racing for teams down there. Costa Rica has a race called Tour of Costa Rica and it's 21 days so it would almost be like the Tour de France for Costa Rica and he definitely was good and raced hard and then put that into us once I started racing and my brother. There's four of us in all, so I have two older brothers and then a younger sister. So my two older brothers are 
eight and six years older. So it was almost like a big gap. And my second oldest brother got into bike racing at a pretty young age from our father as well. And then I grew up watching him race at a young age. And then it was one of those things that's all I wanted to do growing up was to start racing my bike. And you can't hold your first official USA Cycling license until you're 10. So I couldn't wait until I turned 10 years old so I could start racing. And at about 15 is when I noticed cycling was something that I could definitely keep pursuing in the long run. Up to that point, it was always more for just fun and having fun and spending time with my dad and my brother. And by the time I turned 15, I got my first podium at nationals. And then I went to Europe in August of that year and spent a whole month in Belgium and racing over there. And then I came back to the US and it was almost like, okay, I had a lot of success in Europe racing against all these foreign guys and the best people in the world. Then from there, just kept rolling and rolling until I got my first professional contract at 19. My team name is Hagen Sperm in Action and it's run by someone called Axel Merckx and his dad actually is considered the best cyclist that's ever lived. Lance Armstrong originally started the team in 2009 and asked Axel to be the director and once things started going sour for Armstrong a couple years later he sold the rights to Axel and from there Axel took over and at this point it's the team that everyone looks to and they try to get a contract and I was fortunate enough to get one and there's 16 of us in all on the team per year and so it's, it's limited sometimes but take your opportunities when you can take them. So my fiance and I moved to Knoxville in May of 2018 and it was a hard path almost I would say to convince her to come to Tennessee because she's originally from California. It was in that awkward like trying to figure out where we were going to live and she started looking around in Tennessee because I had convinced her to come here and she was looking at places and originally it was going to be Nashville but then she started looking at Knoxville and she found Knoxville and found a house and then from there she kind of took over and I was all for it because I was moving back to the best state in the country. <laughs> it helped a lot coming back to Knoxville because of the U.S. Championship last year. Having Nationals here definitely helped because then I knew what it was like already and it helped me yeah, not come into it blind. The weather in Knoxville this year for Nationals was a bit tricky, so we started out and it was really warm and really sunny, so it was just trying to keep yourself cool. Then midway through, all of a sudden, we're getting dumped on and there's kind of some rain coming in and it made even the course a bit slippery and it made it really muggy, so at the same point, you're like, oh, it's raining, so it's technically shouldn't be as warm, but then you're sweating more because it's just so humid out. And I think it, it caught some people by surprise because you just don't take as many fluids in. And then two laps later, when it's sunny again, you're like, why am I cramping? All of a sudden, it was cooler for the last hour. The most challenging part of the course for me was definitely Sherrod Hill. I'm not that much of a climber, so Anything that goes uphill always kind of starts to make me hurt a little. <laughs> In the break, looks like there's been a little bit of separation up here because that is going to be Hagen's Permit Action's Johnny Brown, who has now attacked off the front of this group. So the last sudden, lap and a half when I was solo, it was no longer Johnny Brown has hit out on his own. Going through my mind was, well, the three guys behind me are the best racers we have in the U.S. right now. And if they all work together, they can bring me back, no problem. So in the back of my mind, it was always like, well, if I just make it to this point, I'm happy with that. And I kept putting kind of small goals in my head, just make it to this point, and then if they catch you, that's okay. And then it just kept going further and further. And once I was in the last few kilometers of the race, it was almost like, well, I can maybe hold him off. Look like he's doing it. Look at Jeff Louder screaming out the driver's side window saying, come on, Johnny, dig deep, now's the time. And then, not until I took the right-hand turn for Clint Jab, it was like, well, I could do this. So I sprinted as hard as I could up Clint Jab, and once I took the left-hand turn, it was like, oh, wow, I did just do this. At 21 years old, he rounds the final turn in Tennessee from 
Tennessee, for Tennessee, Johnny Brown is the 2018 Professional Road National Champion at 21 years old. Hoggins Berman Action has a Stars and Stripes jersey in 2018. Look at his brother. His brother. Even now, I don't think it's fully sunk in three weeks later. Being on the podium on Gage Street downtown was emotional for me because it still at that point was trying to sink in what had happened and you're standing in front of these people putting on a jersey that every professional rider in the U.S. wants to wear at some point in their career and I just did it at the youngest age anyone's ever done so at that point you're thinking like really what just happened and how did this happen to me and how am I this fortunate right now? For all of us to see and feel Johnny Brown stoked with the win here with all of his friends and family around Dave Brown, choking back tears, watching his little brother get the win like this. Such a huge victory. It does not get more special than this. Later on Tennessee Life, we take a stand-up paddleboard trip on the Tennessee River. But next, the Tennessee Baseball League that keeps history alive. One dollar. The Tennessee Association of Vintage Baseball combines a love for the game with a passion for history. From the uniforms to the rules, players and spectators alike step back into the year 1864 and the beginnings of America's favorite pastime. Welcome to the third game of Tennessee baseball. Who's up? When you walk out to a vintage baseball match, uh, we hope that you really feel like you're stepping back into 1864. We'll see you later. I play vintage baseball for the love of the history. At heart, I'm a a history geek and a history promoter. I also feel important that you should be connected to the place where you live and to the stories that are there. That's what makes us unique and what makes us relevant. And so all those things come together in vintage baseball in a very unique and personal way. As a national game, uh, baseball actually started in small communities. It's always been a community game. And uh, eventually, they would get regional variations. So you even hear talk of the Massachusetts game or the New York game being referred to as, as in terms of early baseball. But in my opinion, what really cements baseball as a national pastime is the Civil War. You have all these men uh, going off to war, spending time, a lot of time in camp, and they're looking for a way to entertain themselves. So they start talking about the game they play back home and trying to figure out where they have commonality in rules. And when they leave and go back home, they take that common rule home and it thus spreads as a national pastime. I play with one of the 12 clubs that make up the Tennessee Association of Vintage Baseball, the Knoxville Holstons. In 2013, two teams formed in Nashville. Two gentlemen came together. They had this idea to bring vintage baseball to Tennessee. Two teams became, I believe it was six the next year, and now we're up to 12. So at the end of the season, all 12 teams get together and we play one another, and it's almost like the World Series for vintage baseball for Tennessee. So the Tennessee Association of Vintage Baseball plays the game by the rules of 1864. That was a very conscious decision because in 1864 there's a couple of rules that make the game still familiar uh, to baseball, but it's also a little have a few nuances that makes it exciting and different when you come out to see it. It tends to be a very quick-paced game. Uh, we play with a tradition of no called balls or strikes, so the hitter can stand there and take as many pitches as he needs until that ball is placed where he would like for it to be placed. It, the honor is really won then in the field through defensive play, and that's going to be the rule that most people pick up on the quickest. It's called on the bound rule. So the ball can be hit, hit the ground, bounce up once, and if it's caught, the striker is out. And in fact, that's why we chose 1864. By 1865, the on the bound rule is out of the rule book and the game begins to progress and evolve uh, differently. 
One of the things that I personally have found most exciting about this endeavor is really to dig into the newspapers and find out what we know about the teams that exist here. And that's where we find most of the information about the clubs that we try to recreate throughout Tennessee is through our historic uh, newspapers. For instance, uh, the uniform I'm wearing, we found the information for it, uh, its description, in a Nashville newspaper. It described the club as wearing a blue and red hat with a white star, blue pants with white stripes, and a white shirt. So that's where we get our colors and and our uniform for our club. So when people come out and we talk about the equipment, we usually first ask them about the bat and the ball, and then we'll ask them what's missing. And that being that there is no gloves. This is a bare-handed version of the sport. The glove wouldn't come into fashion until the pitch starts getting a little faster, and then the catcher says, oh, I'm gonna take a work mitt to protect my hands with that pitch coming in faster, and that's how it involves in the game. In our version, the glove's not around, and so we honor that and play the entire nine innings uh, bare-handed. Playing bare hand has its challenges, and most of the players have each worked out their own way of catching the ball, usually trying to cradle it in and absorb as much of the momentum as possible. But it's not uncommon to hear of broken fingers or bruised palms, just like it was reported in the papers. We play with a baseball that looks very different uh, from the modern baseball in that it's made out of a single piece of leather instead of the two horseshoes that come together on the modern baseball. This is a single piece of leather that has two cross stitches that allow it to come together and we refer, refer to it as a lemon peel uh, baseball. So the bases are actually just canvas squares that we usually fill with seed or hay or something that we have around. The bats in vintage baseball or in the 1860s really had only one rule limiting them, and that was the diameter of the bat. So they cannot exceed two and a quarter inches. The shape, the length was up to the comfort of the player. So you'll see various different knobs on the bats that we have out here, various different lengths, different barrels. The big cheer for us is huzzah, so you'll hear us uh, call for that at the end of the game, and so we'll say hip hip huzzah, hip hip huzzah, hip hip huzzah. <laughs> One of the traditions we play by in the Tennessee Association of Vintage Baseball was very much the same that the crowd experienced in 1864 and that's actually being a part of the game and being a witness of the game. So today we're used to the umpire making those decisions. But there's only one umpire for this entire field and he cannot see all of the action that's going on at one given time. So if two players are coming toward a base at the same time to make a tag or an out, and they feel like they got there almost simultaneously, and the umpire doesn't see it, we actually turn to the crowd and say, ma'am, sir, it's your honor. What did you see? Whatever you say goes. So they have a really um, participatory role in the game. So one of the things that I enjoy most about the game is the spirit of play and the spirit of camaraderie. All of the 180 players throughout Tennessee that play vintage baseball, we like to refer to the fact that we're all on the same team, except for when we play each other on that given Saturday or Sunday. And even then, you'll see that we cheer each other's exploits in the field, we'll applaud for a great hit. And it's so encouraging to look down the sidelines and see people enjoying themselves together as families, interacting, talking about the sport, talking about the past, talking about these historic places and reconnecting to them where we always play the games at. So for us, that's the real thrill of being a part of this. It's really been a great experiment and we've enjoyed every moment of it. Across Knoxville, more and more people are taking advantage of a unique outdoor activity. Along with the boats and kayaks, you'll find plenty of stand-up paddle boarders on the Tennessee River. We spoke to the owner of Billy Lush Boards and Brew about why he wanted to bring paddle boarding to Knoxville. So I'm, I'm a local to Knoxville, born and raised in this area. You know, water is a big part of East Tennessee, a lot of bodies of water, five different lakes from 30 to 45 minutes from downtown Knoxville. And so growing up, did a lot of boating, a lot of time in the water. I was a swimmer growing up. So having that love for the outdoors and water and health and fitness has always been a part of my life. I think it was uh, fall of 2011 that I was in Destin, Florida, down in the Gulf, and my wife and I rented paddle boards. That was my first time trying that out. 
it was actually a little bit tougher when you're down in the, where there's waves and things like that and the high winds. So we were like, this is a lot of fun. Probably anybody could really do it. It doesn't have a lot of barrier to entry, if you will. And it was a great workout. It was low impact, so it was something unique for folks that you know are tired of jogging on concrete all the time, looking for something that they can continue doing well on into many years beyond certain age groups. I had a neighbor at the time who had actually started Billy Lush as a brand a couple years prior and was creating a lifestyle fitness brand. And we were just kind of talking in the driveway one day about, hey, how can we do something unique to Knoxville that's kind of up and coming that builds upon the brand he was trying to build from a fitness standpoint. And that's where we thought of the, the paddleboard idea and doing lessons and yoga instruction, fitness classes. And it kind of formed from just conversations in the driveway in the evening. When we first started, we could get 10 people on the water. And a lot of times there were half of those boards weren't, weren't being used when we first started. And now we can get over 40 people on the water with our equipment. Our building is basically about 100 yards away from the Tennessee River. So we are right downtown Knoxville, really convenient access to the water for us. I would say the urban wilderness is basically bringing the outdoor experience of being in the woods or in a park or even in the mountains in East Tennessee and bringing it into the city environment. So that enables you to be close to home, not to travel really far and, and still have that feel of being out in nature. We give folks that opportunity to experience the water where pretty much everything else within the urban wilderness is, is on land. So that's the unique aspect that we bring, whereas we're real close to that. And that gives a, an alternative to what you would typically find within the urban wilderness. So walking and running, that's kind of a common you know, exercise activity. But with all the water access that we have, being able to go paddleboard to kayak right here in the downtown area, this equipment is very big, so it's not convenient for you to have those things downtown. So there's definitely an opportunity to get people on the water for something that's unique from an exercise standpoint. We were really focused on the, the class aspect of everything, right, and trying to fill those up. And, and that was, was a, a piece of what we did and still is today. We also found out that, that people just want to show up. They want to go out and paddle with themselves. They don't really necessarily have to have instruction. They go out and have a good time on their own. And that's been the biggest driver of our business is just the everyday rental aspect of what we do where it's convenient. We're kind of full service, which is different from what separates us from some other rental outfits in the, in the area. You just show up, you sign our waiver, and we get you on the water. You don't have to touch the equipment. You don't have to carry it. I think that adds a benefit to what we do. You know, the first time you paddleboard, I tell everybody when they stand up, they're going to be like a newborn baby deer walking for the first time. So you're gonna have a lot of shakes, a lot of imbalance going on at first, but there's about a 10 minute learning curve where 90% of the folks that come out with us have no problem experiencing the whole paddleboard environment. And the boards are way bigger than the surfboards. So a surfboard is probably, you know, three times smaller than what your typical paddleboard is. That's why you need the wave for it to float. Most of our paddle boards will accommodate 230 to 275 pounds, and that's based on a beginner weight rating the balance aspect of it. Everybody is very nervous about standing and the board's going to flip and turn over on them. Like if you're in a kayak and you lean too far where a kayak might do that or a canoe. Paddle boards do not flip over. I mean, it's almost impossible to do that without having somebody else pulling it down. So they will lean from left to right and that kind of thing. But getting people comfortable with just having that, that movement there is a tip that we always tell folks. That don't, don't worry about it flipping. It's going to stay up for you. So we started out with just paddle boards. That was our, our, our first thing in the rental game. And then as we kind of grew and expanded, we added kayaks, which has been around for a long time and, and something a little bit easier for folks who are a little uncertain with paddle boards. So we have single and tandem kayaks, and we also have a canoe. But the unique thing that we added a couple years ago is our hydro bikes. And they're basically uh, literally a bicycle on pontoons on the water. You pedal the bike, it's got a propeller at the back. It's very easy, leisurely activity. So there's less worry about you know falling off a paddle board or worrying about how to use a kayak. It's just as simple as riding a bike. And then we do yoga that's done through Renegade Boot Camp. And that's basically a whole new element to doing yoga poses except on a paddle board. So we have little anchors that anchor the, the, the folks in place and then they go through all their poses. About three years ago, we were thinking, you know, what else could we add to, to our experience and kind of what we offer? Downtown Knoxville paddling at night is a very unique experience that you really can't have anywhere across the country that we're aware of right now. We call it the City Lights Night Paddle, and we do it every Saturday night. And almost every Saturday night, we're full up with, with guests coming down to, to share that sunset paddle and into the evening. It's a cool experience. So because of all the lights from the bridges and things like that, it's very bright down here all the time. So you're not paddling like in the dark. We do put lights on the boards. It's a cool experience that we started two years ago, actually. So it's still fairly new to our business and has grown tremendously. 
we got our beer license. So we've got eight craft beers that we have on tap and, and now have kind of a, a small bar, you know, inside of our building. So you go out and paddle, come in, have a couple beers. Um, we have food trucks that come out. So we, we're trying to create that, you know, really cool beach atmosphere with what we do. I would definitely say one of the most unique things that we've ever had is a cat wearing a life jacket on a paddleboard. Um, the cat came many times one summer. Typically to see dogs, you know, youth sitting on the front with their parents, that kind of thing. But the cat was definitely the most unique. It's definitely grown a lot. There's a lot more um, rental outfits at different locations around the Knoxville area that weren't around when we first started. So that shows that there's definitely a demand for it as it's grown. And it's funny, you don't hear as many people that are sitting on a boat and you see some what looks like somebody standing on the water going by and like, what, what's going on there? What are they doing? They know, oh, somebody stand up paddle boarding. So you see them popping up around the lakes all the time. So it's definitely expanded a lot. I would almost say it seems like it's becoming more popular than kayak. It's important. I mean, we always saw this as something as an amenity for, for Knoxville. That's part of why we do it and providing that extra experience for the people who live here and also the people that, that visit here to, to have a good time and, and enjoy this waterway. We hope you can get out and catch a game, ride a bike, or head out on the water to enjoy the beautiful outdoor opportunities in our state. I'm Vicki Lawson. See you on the next Tennessee Life. Tennessee Life is sponsored by Mint South Sewing and Fabric has what you need for your creative adventure. If it's sewing, embroidery, or vinyl projects you need for a home business, Etsy, Pinterest, and your family, we have it. Mint South Sewing sells Brothers Sewing and Embroidery Machines and the latest Scan and Cut Crafting Machine. Mint South Sewing and Fabric in the Gallery Shopping Center. Tennessee Life is also brought to you by The Flower Pot. For over 100 years, offering flowers and same-day delivery with two convenient Knoxville locations, knoxvilleflowerpot.com. And by viewers like you. Thank you.